Um, we made it. We made it to the end of our Beatitude series. And if you missed any of them, don't worry. I'm going to go through the entirety of all nine weeks of them right now for the next six hours. So get real comfortable. Maybe door dash something. But no, today is going to be a sort of a recap. But what I want to do is make sure that we landed on the right takeaways. So for the last time, I will be reading Matthew 5, 1 through 12. And I hope these words have been written on your hearts as we've gone through this series. Seeing the crowd, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to them. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And the very first lesson, I asked you guys two sets of questions. The first was kind of like this. Who wants 2024 to be the year that they get some comfort? To be the year that they get to join the kingdom of heaven, inherit the earth? Be filled and satisfied. Maybe someone needs some much needed mercy in 2024. That, that sounds good. Most of us were like, yes, please sign me up for that year. But then I asked the next set of questions. Well, who wants 2024 to be the year you become poor in spirit? The year you really become meek and start to get really hungry and really thirsty. Maybe you're waiting for this one. Who wants to be persecuted? Most of us are like, uh, that's not the package I'd like to sign up for. And so we ask the question, then why would Jesus say the best life you could possibly live, the most blessed life you could possibly live, is characterized by those things? Well, we started off by saying, because Jesus is in the business of happiness. Blessings, beatitudes, is a state of blessedness. And that means supreme happiness. What we in our Christian culture, we would probably call joy unassailable happiness. And Jesus is saying, hey, if you want to have a joyful life, here's the blueprint. And I think one of the reasons why it hits so hard today is that most of us are reluctant to evaluate ourselves against the standards that Jesus sets here. We live in a world of immediate gratification, a world of short bursts of happiness, five-second reels, 20-second reels. Even in the Christian world, there's kind of an atmosphere of easy believism that allows people to get an initial burst of happiness Sunday morning, and then we kind of wane Monday through Saturday. We don't have that deep, long-term joy, but Jesus is going to spell it out for us how to get that all seven days of the week. The Sermon on the Mount is the great statement of King Jesus. It's the marching orders for those who follow him. This new kingdom Jesus creates devastates worldly attitudes. He tells us that the world cannot fill our empty souls. Physical things don't touch the soul. It's a simple point, but we kind of, we kind of don't think about it because people do this all the time. I made this point when we got to Bless Our Poor in Spirit. I said, you know, things get a little rocky for people in the mid midlife crisis or in our marriages, and we go, oh, I know how we'll fix this. We'll remodel the kitchen. Or people say, oh, I know how to save our relationship. Let's have a baby. These physical things, these, these types of stuff, we think they make us happy, but they don't because we're struggling spiritually. And it works the opposite way, though, too. When you're starving, when you skipped breakfast and you skipped lunch and you go and you're telling somebody, I'm so hungry, my head hurts. Someone says, oh, well, have you considered the love and grace of Jesus Christ? Um... Well, I, I have, I guess, but I, I'm still also very hungry. The physical needs and the spiritual needs are completely different from one another. You can't substitute one for the other. And Jesus kicked off the Beatitudes by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. It wasn't by accident. No one in this room, no one who has ever lived or ever will live, has entered the kingdom of heaven all high and mighty. 
You have to have this humbling. Only the incapable, totally dependent on the grace of God, will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Jesus starts here because the entrance to heaven aren't these some grand, glorious gates. It's much lower than we're thinking. You don't walk in all puffed out. Remember, this is a God we're talking to who had to send his son to die on a cross for our sins. And Jesus adds in spirit to this reference, to the inner person. Our spirit is to be begging poor, as we learned. Coming to God in the humbleness for all our spiritual needs. He, he made these people aware of this in the Old Testament. Psalms 34, 18, the Lord is near to thee, brokenhearted, and saves the crushed in spirit. God identifies with people who are begging on the inside, not the self-sufficient, not the people who can just work out their own salvation. Remember, Jesus laid into the Pharisees over and over again for their self-righteousness. I think we need to check ourselves because far too often, and I think we're all guilty of this, we go, yeah, I'm not perfect, but I'm not dropping F-bombs. Oh, wow, okay. I'm not perfect, but I go to church every Sunday. Okay, that's a weird way to show your neighbor you love them. That's a weird way to pray for your enemies. That's a weird way to be humble. Blessed are those who understand their unworthiness. The spiritually destitute, the spiritually bankrupt, those who understand... They'll never be worthy of God on their own merits. Nobody. Jesus says they're the ones living a blessed life. And then we get blessed are those who mourn. And I asked you guys a question when I came upon this lesson. The question was, what do you consider to be the most powerful thing God has done, can do, or will do? What's the most powerful thing that God can do? And then I went through this lesson, and I, I, I talked about how I worry that Many people, like myself, like young David in 2023, thought, oh, okay, blessed are those who mourn, and thought it was talking about general sorrow. Like, blessed are you if you're just sad. All right, cool. And if you are sad, well, great, God will comfort you. There's more to it than that. Sorrow can teach us. It can heal us. It's, it's a regular occurrence. If you live any amount of time here on earth, you're going to experience sorrow. It's a part of life. But we're talking about a different kind of sorrow, a different kind of mourning. And Paul nail, hits the nail on the head here in 2 Corinthians 7.10. He really spells it out for us. He says, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. So it's godly sorrow, godly mourning. It produces salvation. It's a mourning over our failures, our sins, that brings the blessing of comfort. That's key. What we're talking about here is not just generic sorrow, but godly sorrow that's linked to repentance. It's not mourning over our circumstance. It's mourning over our sin. So to answer that question, what's the most powerful thing God can, does, will do, all those things. And, and, it, and it occurred to me when I was preparing that lesson that God the Father has lost more children than any parent will have ever lost. Not only did he give his son to be tortured and beaten and nailed to a cross by his kids, by his own children, did this to his son, he knew that we'd still not get it right. And you add in the fact that he loses me, he loses us so often to this endless cycle of sin and pain and spiritual death, and the only word I can think of to describe this is heartbreaking. We need to be mourning over our sin that adds to that. Do you ever wonder how strong God must be to bear the constant heartbreak from his children, choosing sin over a lifetime of love? Like, how powerful must God be to be the source of joy, the source of comfort of peace, to be love, and still end up being heartbroken over again and again and again? I know that I personally have given God a million reasons not to love me. And none of them have ever changed his mind. 
for meekness, I share a story about the 1930s, 1940s boxer, Joe Lewis, heavyweight champion of the world. Um, I share the story of him getting verbally harassed on a bus by three white guys. He's a, he was a, a black boxer. And just taking it, in fact, there's a, uh, a real-life depiction of this. Copeland Shy drew this for us. Says, okay, you want to fight? This is, this is Joe. Nah. The son's saying, ha. Huh. I don't know what that is. It's in- interpretation, I guess. But we asked, what is meek? And I tried to make it real easy for us. And we said, meek is not weak. In fact, meekness has everything to do with power. You cannot be meek and weak. It's impossible. A simple definition kind of is meek is power under control. Joe Lewis hearing these slurs and insults, sitting there listening with tremendous power to put a stop to it whenever he wanted, very easily could have put a stop to it. It didn't diminish his power. In fact, it maximized his power. When he got off the bus and he handed those three guys his business card that just said Joe Lewis, boxer. Power under control. Whoa. Way more powerful than if he had just stood up and pummeled those dudes. Jesus described himself as meek. But at the same time, he was the powerful man to ever walk the earth. Power over illness and disease. Power over the weather. Power over demons and evil. Power over death. And on the mount, he declared, blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. Every step Jesus took, every encounter he had, he exampled it. What does meekness look like in public? Jesus was like, watch, I'll show you. You all have power. You all have power over stuff, over people, maybe a bunch of people, maybe a couple people. Maybe big things, maybe little things, but you all have dominion and power. So do I. It's it's actually really unhelpful when we downplay our power. A better question to ask is, is your power under the control of King Jesus? When you think about a situation when someone embodies power out of control, power off the rails... We've all seen that. We've all experienced it. Maybe it was a a teacher, maybe a coach, maybe a a parent, maybe a spouse. My wife and I drove separate cars today. Don't. mm -mm. Not her. But we've all experienced power out of control. How How do we respond to that? Does everybody go, oh, this is great. Thanks. More of this, please. No. No, thank you. I'd like less time with you. This has not been enjoyable for me. Power out of control looks like someone who lashes out at real or falsely perceived wrongs. Power out of control is selfish impulses where you're only concerned about what's going on in your world. Power out of control complains. Maybe they'll describe it as constructive criticism. This is what a lack of meekness looks like in our world. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And what's the most valuable thing on earth? I would offer its relationships. I can't think of anything more valuable than that. A rich life, a blessed life, is one that's full of healthy relationships. With God, of course, but also with our loved ones, with our family, with our kids, with our parents, with our neighbors, with our friends, with our coworkers. Those are people living a blessed life. Sometimes we demonstrate that we get stuck in this pattern of life because we learned it from our parents or we developed these habits on our own, but we're showing that we're unchained and selfish and irrational and angry, even just negative. And there's something within us that causes us to lose power and then hurt others. And here's the real ironic part of that. Who ends up getting the most hurt by that? It's the people you're going to say that you love the most. They're the ones who are going to suffer from this. Those who can't, ref- or can't or refuse to place their power under the control of Christ, get ready to forfeit all the good things God has promised this side of eternity. Now we're moving on to hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Today, I feel like when we say we're hungry, we're like, all right, it's like 11, 15-ish, and I had breakfast at 7. David wrapped this up. I'm hungry. 
And we know people who get hangry, starving, hungry, thirsting. And we can grasp the concept that our bodies need food and water, that without it, we suffer, we struggle. And like when you think about doctors and people who are taking care of people that are very sick, what is one of the most troubling signs for a doctor? When someone stops eating. So for hungering and thirsting for righteousness, we ask, are you concerned by the amount of hungering and thirsting you're doing for God? How hungry and how thirsty are you for things of God? And if you're not hungry and thirsty for righteousness, what are you hungering and thirsting for? What do you got to fill yourself with? And I gave you guys three things, three spiritual junk foods, as I called them. The first one was legalistic Christianity. This is the Doritos and unhealthy snacks of the world. And legalistic Christianity is where we reduce Christianity in our lives to a bunch of do's and don'ts, can's and can'ts, should and shouldn'ts, do this and not this. And if you're a good Christian, you'll be perfect and make sure everyone sees you as perfect. This is the Pharisee mindset. And remember, Jesus said, unless you become more righteous than the Pharisees, you will never see heaven. We create this environment where the emphasis is kind of just on gaining head knowledge, just living these fake, perfect lives. Remember, the Pharisees knew the Old Testament. They knew Scripture. How well did that serve them? We can be so worried that our life fits in this nice, neat little box, all for the glory of God. That's what makes a good Christian a rule follower. Look how big my Bible is. The problem here is it's rules without relationship leads to rebellion. I gave you guys the example of that shelter kid who doesn't get any candy or any soda or or any junk food, and then they go to the birthday party, and what are they doing? They're licking frosting off a cake. They're cramming food in. Why? Why? Because it's rules without relationships leads to the rebellion. The next thing was lukewarm Christianity. And that's where we believe in God, but we live as if he doesn't exist. It's Christianity in name only. Like, this fits my schedule, so I'll make an effort. This is how I behave anyway, so I'm doing a good job. Remember, if we're going to do something anyways, it's not surrendering to God's will. It's called coincidence. If your faith amounts only to Sunday mornings, and Sunday is doing all the heavy lifting of your faith, I have maybe some potentially upsetting news for you. Satan loves that. He's thrilled. He's like, yeah, yeah, give Jesus Sundays. I'll take Monday through Saturday, no problem. And the last thing that just doesn't work, the spiritual junk food that gives us that momentary burst of happiness that we were talking about at the beginning, that this blessed life is comfortable Christianity. And that's where I will embody the Beatitudes as long as I don't have to get too uncomfortable. We love our comfort. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being comfort in the physical world, but what's wrong with being a Christian who's comfortable? I'll tell you, it's because we get to this point where we say, meh, I'm good enough. That's enough Jesus today. That's enough time talking to God this week. That's enough time reading my Bible. That's definitely enough time fellowshipping with my brothers. Uh That was enough time going to Sundays this year. And again, Satan Satan doesn't want you to get uncomfortable. He wants you nice and comfy. Don't start making changes. Don't start having a closer relationship with God. Don't start fellowshipping with people who are constantly seeking him, who are growing spiritually. Don't do that. Don't hunger and thirst for righteousness, because then your appetite will change. And the really cool thing about this beatitude is it kind of becomes self-fulfilling. You hunger and thirst for righteousness, you get filled, you get righteousness, and then you hunger and thirst for righteousness, and you get filled with righteousness. And the same is of the next beatitude. We come across mercy. Mercy is special. It's more than forgiveness. It's a product of love. Mercy can be both in the physical world and the spiritual. For instance, we can give a poor man money. We can feed the homeless. But at the same time, we can spend time with those who are lonely. We can love those who are hard to love. We can forgive people. Kind of rough around the edges. Because mercy never holds a grudge. It never retaliates. It never takes vengeance. It never uses another's sins and failures against them. Mercy sees others' struggling relationship with God and others and shows compassion. And again, what do we gain by being merciful? It's that same self-fulfilling thing. God gives us mercy, 
we are merciful, God gives us more mercy. And around and around we go. God pours mercy upon mercy upon mercy to those who show mercy. He's merciful to us. Are we being merciful to others? From there we go to blessed are the pure in heart. And it all starts in the heart. Jesus said, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree will be recognized by its fruit. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What King Jesus was talking about here when he said pure in heart is what's happening in the mind, which controls the will, which controls our emotions, which controls our actions. This statement was, again, a direct shot at the Pharisee, legalistic, self-righteous rulers of the day who were telling everyone all they need to do is just take out hair of the outside. Just, uh, all right, good, good. Yeah, you're good, go. The heart is super critical to Jesus. What we are in the deep, private areas of our life is what he cares about most. He cares about the roots, not just the pretty branches. Jesus did not come into the world simply because we have some bad habits that need to be broken. He came into the world because we have sinful hearts that needed to be purified. No one is good enough. No one ever has been or will be good enough. And what we're talking about here is a transformation from the inside out. Do you guys ever wonder why sin is so appealing? Why are we so drawn into sin? Why can't we keep our hearts pure? And I would offer, it's because our flesh doesn't care about eternity. It's not going with us. So as if our bodies are saying, well, who cares about tomorrow? Let's enjoy today. And this is how we so quickly follow and embrace that's follow your heart ethos. It's one of these uh, world's beatitudes, as I've said. And it's kind of like every Disney movie and silly rom-com. And it's no mystery why follow your heart is such a popular ethos these days. It's easy. Salad or french fries? French fries. Yeah, french fries. Yeah. Stay up late or go to, go to bed early so you can wake up early. Yeah, stay up late. It's fun. Feels good. It's easy. Kind of lets you off the hook. Well, that wasn't my fault. I was just following my heart. You imagine my kid came up to me and said, Dad, I ate all my Halloween candy. In one sitting, I was just following my heart, Dad. We chuckle and we laugh, but that's what we do to God. Oh, sorry, God. I was just following my heart. My heart led me to this sin. My bad. If we dig into the real substructure underneath following our heart, if we really want to get to the heart at it, sorry, dad joke, we get to some variation of do what feels right. And from there, it's a short step to do what feels good. And from there, you're like, well, if it feels good, do it. And if you're living your life based on if it feels good, do it, I guarantee you're going to have way more problems than, than you realize. Like that is sin. It's guaranteed to be that. Jesus knows that our hearts must first be changed. And we experience this heart shift, this change in appetite. Our behaviors, our actions, our external lives will change as a result of it. Jesus wants our hearts to genuinely desire things that are pleasing to him. Then our lives will reflect and produce huh, things that are pleasing to him. Oh, and what blessing do we get from this one, by the way? Oh, that's right. Just the ability to see God. Oh, how often do we hear, man, if I just knew God was there, if I just knew he was working in my life, if I just knew he had a plan, how often do we hear that? And Jesus is like, hey, guess what? There's a way. There's a way to do that. Purify your heart. And we come upon our last two. These are probably two of the hardest all about how we interact with others. A lot of people in the world today would consider peace the absence of conflict. And any person who spent time with family, a mom and dad, a husband or wife, or just because a boss at work didn't yell at you, doesn't mean there's peace. If I walk by Tamara and go, oh, she knows. She knows. And that's where you get the, are you mad at me? No. Just because there's no argument does not mean there's peace. As Jesus saw it, there's so much more to peace than just the absence of conflict. Peace is the presence of righteousness that causes right relationships. And I've said this 
over and over and over. This is so important. Jesus came not to start a religion. He came so we could have a right relationship with God and with each other. It's the literal definition of righteousness. What ends up happening is we end up settling for truces instead of peace in our world. In our lives, truces don't fix problems. They just kind of sweep them under the rugs. It's like, everything's fine. Everything's fine. My house is clean. Just don't open that closet. That's like our lives. But this peace that the Bible's talking about never shies away from issues. It's never a peace at any price. It conquers the problem. It builds bridges. And sometimes that means a struggle. Sometimes that means pain. But in the end, real peace can come. If we're to make peace, one of the truths we need to understand is that we can't seek it at the expense of righteousness. We cannot divorce peace from purity. What was the beatitude right before this? Blessed are the pure in heart. We all seek to avoid needless stress and conflict and arguments at home, at work, or wherever. But if we avoid those things to the point of sacrificing truth, we don't have peace at all. I believe in the world today, it sounds like this. Well, I didn't want to offend anyone. Or I need people to respect my boundaries. So many Christians are setting up boundaries as a means to not make peace and live with truces. Christians can't say things like, well, I need to watch out for what's best for me and only me. Especially if what's best for me is the opposite of what God has called you to do in your life. It's not a boundary, that's sin. Listen, I love the idea of knowing your limits, knowing when to say no and when to say yes. But when did Jesus say, hey, just be a peaceful person, but make sure people know they can't talk to you that way. Set up a boundary as a means to avoid making peace. Just protect yourself from everyone. Again, this is not to say that we can't say no when it needs to be no and yes when it needs to be yes. But I think the question we have to ask ourselves is why do we as Christians think it is okay to set up boundaries that keep us from loving the people Jesus called us to love. Why do we think that's okay? Did Jesus not wash Judas' feet even though he knew he was going to betray him? He still washed his feet. A biblical peacemaker does not let sleeping dogs lie. They don't keep the status quo. We have to be willing to enter the conflict, take up our cross, and deny our selfish selves to be bold. And then finally we come to Probably one of the hardest things to do as a disciple of Christ. Be willing to be persecuted and rejoice and be glad over it when it happens. Some of your translations will say insult instead of revile. And it's like, oh, persecuted, insulted. Oh, lies of evil spread about me. Awesome, where do I sign up for this? Last week we took a deep psychological dive into the idea and concept of victim mentality. And it's a big problem for America as a society as a whole, but it's a really, really big problem for Christians for so many reasons. But I think to start, what is most sad for me is that this victim mentality is hurting the message of Jesus. A beautiful message that I think everybody in here agrees we want people to know and hear and experience. But because of the victim mentality, we're often seen as crybabies, as people crying wolf, not actually willing to fix problems. And as a result, a lot of people are turned off to Christian culture and by extension are defaulted into turning off actually wrestling about the things of Jesus. And I think the reason why it just really, really troubles me, this Christian victim mentality, is because there's plenty of real persecution going on in the world. Yet when we take negative pushback as the result of our own arrogance and insensitivity and hostility and lack of love and call it persecution, we cheapen and detract from real examples of religious Christian persecution in the world. When Christians who are being thrown into prison and beheaded are overshadowed by stories of American Christians who get into hot water because of business discriminations, because of saying weird things on Facebook because of making their co-workers miserable. We become guilty of this self-centered arrogance. Being persecuted for our faith 
is way different than being persecuted because we're acting like jerks. So the question is, what in my life would even make the world want to persecute me? Are my actions as a disciple of Christ loud enough for someone in the world to notice me and notice my recognition of my devotion to Jesus Christ? Do they even notice? But even if I was to be persecuted for that, the bottom line is that persecution provides believers with unique opportunities to witness and testify of God's glory and power. We are not victims. We are overcomers. We need to rejoice in the prosecution as opportunities to bring him glory, to draw closer to him and to allow him to bless us in ways that only he can. And whoo, nine weeks. Little bow on it. We're almost good at time. I loved preparing these lessons for you all. And I loved getting to have a better understanding of what Jesus has been trying to tell me for so long. I am so guilty of misunderstanding what Jesus meant in these Beatitudes over and over and over, taking them all at surface level. But I also feel like I fell into this very common trap, trap we can all fall into. And it it sounds like this. It kind of would sound like this. If it's Tamara and I, Tamara says, hey, honey, will you do the laundry? I'm really tired. And I go, well, is this a divorce issue? And she goes, have you lost your mind? Of course not. Like, why would you even ask that? And I would go, oh, well, if it's not a divorce issue, I don't want to do it. And then later she says, hey, honey, will you wash the dishes? The kids have really worn me out today. I'm just so tired. I ask again, hey, honey, is this a divorce issue? And she goes, of of course not. Well, then I don't want to do it. And every single thing that Tamara, my wife, asked me, I go, oh, divorce? Nope, well, I don't want to do it. How long is my marriage going to last? How is our relationship going to work? Yeah, right. No, I, 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 no. You're right. I worry that we treat God this way. Lord, is this a salvational issue? Come on, is this a, is this a what's the least I can do? If it's not a salvation issue, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. God has feelings too. How many of you would want to be in a relationship with someone like that, the bare minimum? Is this a salvation issue? I don't, I don't, I'm not going to do it. Jesus laid it all out there for us. How to live our lives. It's like our chores for salvation, chores to earn these blessings. John 14, he says, If you love me, keep my commands. Do you love Jesus? Are you keeping his commands? Are we going to be doing the bare minimum Or are we going to live the lives Jesus has called us to live? Are we going to embody these beatitudes? Not one, not just a couple, when we feel like it. Is this going to be the checklist for how we go about our days from here on out? I hope so. Because if we can start living this life, this blessed life that Jesus has promised, it is going to transform our homes our relationships, our lives, this church, our communities. Don't you want to be the reason that someone feels blessed? Because you brought these blessings into their life, these blessings that Jesus gave you. If you're listening to this sermon today and you're ready to start living a blessed life for the rest of your life, do it. Today. Grab an elder, grab a deacon, grab a preacher, grab, grab anybody. Don't wait. No one's promised tomorrow. Make today the day you turn your life around. Why don't you come as we stand and sing?